Do you ever come home from work really excited about the ways in which you've failed? Do you wish you could fail more? And do you boast about it when you do? Of course not. That would just be weird. No matter how much we tell ourselves that we can only be successful if we're prepared to fail and that true learning comes from failure, we still beat ourselves up and obsess about it when we do. This is a very special episode of You Are Not A Frog. It's a live panel discussion recorded at the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management Leaders in Healthcare Conference in November. I'm joined by Dr. Taj Hassan, consultant in emergency medicine and past president of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. He's on the board of trustees for the FMLM, amongst many other different roles. I'm also joined by Dr. Claire Edwin, a GP trainee and one of the National Medical Director's Clinical Fellows, and Dr. Sally Ross, a GP, appraiser and NHS England clinical advisor, who has spent several years working both in general practice in the NHS and in the Royal Navy. We chat about various failures we've experienced, how we could deal with failure better and how we often fail more by not acting when needed rather than failing through the stuff that we actually do do. So join us to find out why people pleasing can lead to failure, how a simple acronym like AFOG can help turn a failure into a learning experience and how we should go about disclosing our failures to our teams without losing their trust. Welcome to You Are Not A Frog, the podcast for doctors and other busy professionals who want to beat burnout and work happier. I'm Dr Rachel Morris. I'm a GP, now working as a coach, speaker and specialist in teaching resilience. Even before the coronavirus crisis, we were facing unprecedented levels of burnout. We have been described as frogs in a pan of slowly boiling water. We hardly noticed the extra long days becoming the norm and have got used to feeling stressed and exhausted. Let's face it, frogs generally only have two options. Stay in the pan and be boiled alive or jump out of the pan and leave. But you are not a frog and that's where this podcast comes in. It is possible to craft your work and life so that you can thrive even in difficult circumstances. And if you're happier at work, you'll simply do a better job. In this podcast, I'll be inviting you inside the minds of friends, colleagues and experts, all who have an interesting take on this, so that together we can take back control and love what we do again. For those of you listening to the podcast who need to get some continuous professional development hours under your belt, did you know that we create a CPD form for every episode so that you can use it for your documentation and in your appraisal? Now, if you're a doctor and you're a fan of inspiring CPD and you're sick of wasting a lot of time you don't have on boring and irrelevant stuff, then why not check out our Permission to Thrive membership, a joint venture between me and Caroline Walker, who's the Joyful Doctor. And every month we're going to be releasing a webinar fully focused on helping you thrive in work and in life. Every webinar is accompanied by an optional workbook with a reflective activity so that you can take control of your work and your life. You can increase your well-being and you can design a life that you're going to love. You've got to get those hours. So why not make your CPD count? Choose CPT that's good for you. So check out the link to find out more. Hi there, everybody. Welcome to everyone who's listening back on the You Are Not A Frog podcast. And we're delighted to be um, here at the final session of the Leaders in Healthcare Conference 2021 with the Faculty of Medical Leadership, Man uh, Leadership and Management. So thank you guys for having us. And I'm very delighted to be able to host this panel discussion with three esteemed colleagues and leaders all about failure because I think failure is something well we've done some podcasts about failure but it's something we're still not that comfortable with nobody really likes to fail and I thought what a, what a brilliant opportunity to get some people together to hear a few sort of battle stories and to think about actually why failure oh, why we learn so much from failure and, and how we can do it better and learn better without beating ourselves up because I think if it, it's one thing that we do very well in healthcare is beat ourselves up when we fail and then we might fail to learn from our failure which is an even bigger failure. so before we go any further let's just introduce our panel so first of all we've got Dr Claire Edwin and Claire is a National Medical Director's Clinical Fellow so Claire tell us a little bit about about you and what you do. Hi everyone well 
yeah, I'm one of the National Medical Directors Clinical Fellows for this year, um, working between NHS England and the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management, which it's basically an opportunity to get sort of parachuted to work with sort of senior leaders and managers in healthcare organisations throughout the UK. And it's a great privilege to be here today. Feeling a little bit uh, nervous, given how much more experienced my fellow panel members are, but hopefully I can provide some insight into my failures, my micro failures. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Claire. And next we've got Taj Hastan with us. Taj um, is a big consultant in emergency medicine for the last 22 years. He's also the past president of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. And what else are you up to at the moment, Taj? Well, thank you. Thanks, for, firstly, for uh, inviting me. My failure was came yesterday. I lost my voice, so it's just coming back. So that would have been a difficult panel discussion today. So good to join you all. Other things that I do, I'm involved in some international work in Pakistan and some of the South Asian country. Pakistan is originally where I'm from, and uh, we're trying to help develop emergency medicine in Pakistan. I try desperately to keep my head above water with three young children who uh, constantly tell me I'm a failure. So that that's that's always a good leveller. Thank you. Thanks, Taj. I mean, there's nothing like kids to really bring you back down to earth. Is there? <laughs> Mine just think I'm a constant failure, which is, you know, it's good for the old ego. Anyway, <laughs> and also we're joined by uh, Sally Ross. So Sally is one of my GP colleagues from our Red Whale uh, Leadership Courses team. And Sally's had a, a long career in the in the military, ex-Royal Navy, and worked in loads of roles in, in general practice. Uh, Sally, tell us a little bit more about you. I'd just like to point out that it's Claire and Rachel who've both used words like experience and long, which really depicts me as old. Thank you, Taj, for not going down that route. So yeah, long career. I started off in the military, various leadership training events over that, and then came into the NHS and I'd done sort of had an equal balanced career between the two. I'm now a portfolio GP and as well as clinical work as a locum now, having been a senior partner, I do some clinical advising for NHS England. I teach for the deanery, teach the trainers, and I'm an appraiser and a facilitating practices. So I'd just like to kick this discussion off by talking about micro failures, actually, because when I spoke to Claire before this uh, podcast episode, she was saying, well, I've had lots of little micro failures and then that's the big ones as well. And actually, I think often it's the micro failures that we really, really stress, stress about. I mean, Claire, what would you describe as micro failures? They're the little things that you do that you might miss and they might not really have much of a consequence. Some of them, I think, in our day to day life, we don't really dwell on them at all. So when someone asks you about failure, you just wrap your brains like, well, I haven't failed my exam or I failed my driving test. But I guess we're talking about the small things that we all do. You know, in my everyday life, I'm pretty bad at washing up. And my other half is constantly telling me that he's had to rewash things up. And then more recently, sort of professionally, my new role as, you know, in a more managerial environment, I have a, a task every week to summarise a lot of data into a key slide that does go quite high up. Um, and the first week I did it, it took me hours and hours and hours. And I, you know, went over and over the slide several, several times and sent it up and it got signed off. And then the next day I received a quite a difficult phone call saying that I'd forgotten to change a tiny date on the bottom right hand corner of the slide. Obviously, not actually that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things, but certainly something I dwelled on and I learned from. So I wrote a note to myself on my crib sheet so I can't forget to do something like that again. But I guess the difference between those are micro failures that you dwell on that are actually quite small and insignificant, but perhaps they play on your mind versus the ones that we do and we just don't think anything of. Yeah. Taj, what, what's your opinion of these, these micro failures, just things that we encounter every day? Do, do they bother you? One micro failure perhaps doesn't, you know, you knock it away. And then if you get, usually, as is the way of life, we uh, have a run of uh, two, three or four, and then you sort of want to hide in a deep corner. So, you know, whether that's a, a personal micro failure with my, my wife telling me that I don't hang out the washing very well and that therefore it doesn't dry properly, or getting to work and find bought along two pairs of scrubs, which are trousers, or, or then, of course, the micro failure on the shop floor clinically and emergency departments are a pretty hectic place where it's uh, possible to uh, perform a number of micro failures per, per minute, per hour. And, and that happens and, and you, you just really have to have your antenna about you. So 
I think caring for yourself actually is another micro failure. I always feel guilty when I don't do enough exercise, which then doesn't make me very um, sharp. And I regard that as a micro failure. So you can really uh, beat yourself up on a daily basis really well and uh, try and uh, take a deep breath and keep going forwards. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that beating ourselves up is often about these just basic human errors. Like you forgot to change the date or you, you read something wrong and you know, no one can operate at 100% all the time, but we, we do feel absolutely dreadful. Now, when I spoke to Sally before this podcast, I'm like, Sally, we're going to get together. We're going to talk about all those times we failed. And I love Sally's response. I hope you don't mind me sharing it. She was like, well, I'm sure there's loads of times I've failed, Rachel, but you know what? I can't really think of any. Sally, tell us why that is. Well, I think it's maybe it's because I have low expectations of myself. So every day I'm surprising myself by achieving simple things like, you know, flossing my teeth. But the truth is that I think because of my very early military training, I think we, I grew up in a culture where when things go wrong, you just embrace it as an opportunity to really analyze why it's gone wrong. And particularly if you share it with others, I think you can just extract a sort of learning from it or, e or even, even dare I say, some fun from it. So I, I think, yeah, I think I, I I probably should see these things as failures, but I don't. I just see them as a routine part of everyday life. I think it just happens all the time to me. <laughs> I just muddle on. Yeah, and I think you, you were also saying to me that everything in the military is set up to almost fail fast in a, in a practice setting so that, that that doesn't happen when the, the stakes are really high. Do you think we do that in healthcare or is that very specific to the military? I think it's very difficult in healthcare. The the idea, the military, I think, is just the best training organisation certainly I've ever come across. And the whole purpose is that you, precisely as you said, Rachel, you train and train and train so that you don't fail for real. The problem with healthcare is that whilst we do that during our training years, it's not really something you can stop and do. It'd be really interesting to hear what Taj says here. And I'm sure that they do have an opportunity to do training in the A&E world. But we very rarely have the time, I think, in the NHS to take time out to do quite big training events. And so, so I think they are different. They are different situations. I think it'd be wonderful if we could find time in NHS healthcare in our teams to to practice and do lots of simulations. Taj, back to back to you. Are are we are we embracing failure more these days and really trying to trying to fail when we do simulations, or are we still a bit scared of that? Um, no, I, I, I think expectations are different, aren't they? You know, certainly perhaps when Sally and I were more junior doctors, you know, you you seem to almost uh, muddle through and or maybe just the human nature is that you don't remember. But, but certainly expectations are, are, of or the medical profession are different now. And, and that results in in greater challenge and the intensity of the demand, whether it's general practice at the front end or whether it's the emergency department. And I think certainly when I was at the Royal College, you know, we were very aware of that on the need to assist our, our, our team members, both in terms of how they cared for themselves and their team. And so we, I think we were one of the first colleges back in 2011 to develop a, a, a strategy around uh, sustainability and you know enjoying your specialty and that was really quite powerful when we presented that at national conferences because it was almost an acknowledgement of the fact that actually it was okay to not feel great uh, it was okay to share that with your team and it was okay to be supported by your team and Claire I know you, you've had experiences of simulation <clears throat> where actually Bailey was really helpful I worked as an expedition medic in Costa Rica about two and a half years ago and we were working in a remote uh, national park. So every time we were deployed, um, we did like three weeks stints, and we had to do a practice CASI wrap. So this was the first rotation where we were uh, leading a group of sort of 17, 18 young people. I was running a CASI wrap exercise. We were in quite a, a hilly area, quite remote, and it soon became apparent that our, our casualty would require being stretched. And everyone looked to me as the, as the medic, asking where the stretch was. And then I realised that I'd forgotten stretcher. So all the volunteers are obviously delighted that nobody had to be practised a stretcher across a hilly mountainside. But I guess it, it does teach you the value of, of stimulation. Afterwards, we had a debrief 
And I think often that is where we are lacking in healthcare, finding the time to do those debrief and reflect on what went wrong, admit to your mistake and learn from it. So from that day on, we always did a checklist in the morning. What equipment do we have and who has X, Y or Z, including the um, stretcher, which luckily we never needed to use. Oh, that's that's a really great example. And I know Sally always says that actually fail stands for first attempts in learning. Is that right, Sally? Yeah. Yeah. I have to credit our colleague Joe Scrivens for that. But I think it's so true. First attempt in learning. So there are these, these failures that we, we want to learn from. And if we can learn in simulation so that actually no nobody gets harmed, that's that's even better. But as leaders, I think we do stuff that's a little bit more nuanced and, and a bit more tricky. And we're often dealing with decisions where you don't know what the right answer is. You don't know what the right thing to do is. And so it is almost a given. You almost need to fail to do stuff in order to learn what the right way to do things are. And have there been any, any times in your leadership where you thought, actually, that that was a wrong decision? But actually, OK, we, we've learned from them that we're going to do this now. And, and if so, how, how did you handle that with your team in terms of saying that, in terms of sort of, ad, ad, I hate the word admitting it, but, you know, in terms of sharing that with them? Can I, Taj, have, have you got any, any examples or, or, or thoughts about how a leader should admit failure when they genuinely have got something wrong? Yeah, I think this is so... so uh... So difficult. We always perceive that in the heat of the moment, especially in somewhere like the emergency department, you have to make decisions right there and then. But actually, clinical decisions we you know we can perhaps set aside. Uh, even you know the emergency clinical situation, you can stabilize a particular you know situation to try and gather more information. But I think in the wider setting, which I suppose for me has been a lot of the college work I've been involved in. For, for many years in the past. And, and I think w- when I look back on things that didn't go well, uh, and there were times where I really did reflect and, and I realized that some of it was my failure to communicate. It was my failure to engage. It was my failure to build consensus. It was my failure to really understand as much as I should have done. At some stage, you do have to make a decision because otherwise you just sit there in a corner doing nothing. But But I think trying to make that judgment of of trying to achieve consensus and when you, you you actually perhaps are a bit too impetuous. And when that's happened, how have you handled it? Have you sort of just it just just carried on and hoped that it would sort of go away or faced up and made a big deal or or some sort of halfway house? Well I've I've had, as I say, you know, my fair share of failure in in, in that arena. And I think there have been a couple of times one where you know I, I I think I I I did the right thing, but some of the, some of the others in my senior exec group didn't believe so, and I just worked harder at it till till they actually acknowledged that this guy's working really hard, and perhaps it's that I have whatever biased view. Equally, I've been at the other end of the spectrum where perhaps they were right, but I felt really awful about it because of. The situation we were in and so you know there was a, a situation where I really needed to share my my emotions my feelings with with that senior group knowing that one or two of them were very much uh, say against my views on, on that area but that's the nature of you know tough politics or you know policy making uh, and so I shared that and I said I just just want you to know you know all of you that you know this has been really hard for me and you know, I've been waking up at four o'clock in the morning for the last week thinking about it. And I just wanted to share about how awful I felt. And I think that was quite humbling for some of those people because they didn't really appreciate, perhaps, because we're all human, even though we might be in a leadership role. And I think it's quite nice to share that emotion with people. It was something which is a fine judgment decision. But once you make that judgment, then you have to go with a cabinet view. So, yeah, I think those are some of the experiences I've had. And that, that's a fantastic example of modelling really vulnerable leadership, because vulnerability isn't about saying something, you know, people will agree with, but it's actually saying something you're not quite sure how people are going to react. But it's actually a bit of self-disclosure and a bit of, 
yeah, you're, you're coming out for your protective thing and actually sharing how you're feeling about stuff. And Sally, have, have you had examples where that type of vulnerable type leadership around failure has, has been really effective or are there times when it's not quite so effective? Yeah, I was really interested in what Taj just said. I, I do agree that time is something that we undervalue in decision making. And I think that we can get caught out by that. And I would add to that, um, trying to work alone. And I think there is this, there's still a kind of a legacy idea that to be a leader, you've got to be the all powerful person with um, unique accountability who acts in and makes all the decisions. And that very authoritarian style of leadership, I don't think has a place very often. I don't think in healthcare, actually. And I think that when you act alone, well, by definition, you don't get that, that cognitive diversity, which leads to a stronger decision. And so I think one of the best ways to mitigate difficulties and failure, if you like, as a leader is, is to share. But as Taj said, it's it's got to be really balanced because you have got to step forward as the person who's willing to be accountable, but you've got to allow others to have responsibility. And so I think I think of lots of situations over the years where I have perhaps, particularly as an extrovert, have wanted to step forward and said, oh, you know, I can do this and I can do that, I can do the other. And you just have to step back, allow others. And I think for me, delegation is one of the arts of leadership and allow others around you um to, to actually run with things and you've got to be willing to let people have their head and know that if they do if they do muck up that you'll still support them and you'll still be accountable for them mm-hmm. and you're less likely to fail and if you do fail then you're sharing it with others you're not failing all on your own yeah isn't there a balance to be struck though because if you've got a leader that's constantly going well, I'm not quite sure and you know oh my gosh I got that wrong yesterday and you know they're constantly showing but they're constantly sharing uncertainty and all that would that not destabilize the team yes i think from a a junior clinical perspective i think um it's really wonderful when you have leaders that are quite open and honest obviously we look to our senior you know consultant colleagues or senior clinical colleagues to ultimately make a decision in, in really difficult scenarios but in that sort of team building space i think it's really important to hear how people have made mistakes or or how they've come to a particular conclusion or decision I think it's really important your leaders or as a leader you're not constantly going through your mistakes which if we're talking about failures being micro failures every day kind of a constant stream of things that your your senior senior is describing to you I think you need if it's a big failure you need to have had time to formulate and sort of reflect on that that and have a learning point to give to your team otherwise I think it could cause more breakdown in a, in a, a team if you sort of lose that, that trust in your your leader so it's it's more like if, if you're a leader and, and you've you've failed at something or, or something's happened rather than sharing it when you're right in the middle of it maybe take some time reflect take some action and, and then share it with the team once you sort of n- know what's know what's going to happen and I've got some personal support and all all that lot otherwise sometimes that can it's not about losing everyone's trust but it can make other people feel a bit un- uncertain and, and vulnerable as well I mean what would the military say about that Sally? You did touch on the word trust and I think that that is absolutely key to leadership as well as good communication because I think if you have a really good trusting relationship then the communication isn't just from the leader to to the team but also the other way around so you've got to create an environment where where people know that you too as the leader can can hear challenge but as you were saying earlier you don't want and as Claire was saying you don't want to show your vulnerability and your your weaknesses too much but but you want to invite challenge when it's appropriate and so I think I think those are really important features of of avoiding failure and I think the other thing is consistency I think for all of us in anything we do, we, we need to try really hard to be consistent in our behaviours because then that leads to better communication and trust because people people just, it's basically knowing each other, I think. I think it's important to allow people to know you, even if you feel that makes you vulnerable. Yeah, that's a tricky one. What I'd like to do is now think about different types of failure. We talked about those micro failures and it talks about sort of failure through lack of communication. I think when I've been talking to people sort of out, outside this recording session, I've been talking about sometimes the feeling that we've maybe 
fails in our in our careers when we've decided to uh, change from one thing which didn't suit us to another thing or we decided to finish that role why do you think we badge ourselves so quickly as having failed to do something when we've tried something and we've just maybe not enjoyed it or not worked and I'm going to come to Claire because I know you sort of told me you experienced this a little bit recently yeah so I out on a core surgical training pathway um, and I've finished my two years and, and now I'm doing this fellowship but after a huge amount of rumination, reflection, and then boring anybody that would be uh, listening to me about it, I've, I've realised that you know a career in surgery probably isn't the best thing for me, and I'm and I'm going to pursue a career in general practice, which I'm when I really take a step back, I'm super excited about. I think it's much better fit for me, really. I do feel I have this sense, probably incorrectly, that it's like a failure in what I set out to do. I know when I speak to other people. Externally, they're like, you know, don't be ridiculous. I can see that you feel like you're failing, but you, you haven't failed anything. There's nobody's not signed you off. You've not failed an exam. You can do it if you want to. It's just it's sort of validating yourself. And I feel like there is a perfectionist attitude, in particularly in doctors, um, where if you set out to do something and you don't achieve it, it does feel like you've you've failed. I know it's not a failure, but I'm also fairly sure that I'm not the only person that been through that sort of feeling mm. it's interesting because sort of having looked at lots of career coaching and counseling and stuff like that I think it's much more of a failure to persist doing something that you don't enjoy that's not using your strengths etc than actually make the the very brave decision to, to to change what you're doing and I think there's another type of failure as well I'd be interested in Taj and Sally's view on this as well because I've been talking to lots of doctors that feel that they failed when they, and they, this is indefinitely in vertical, have difficulty coping when they've just done a, a week of nights and they're knackered or the work is just far, far too much and they're feeling that they failed because they maybe had a little cry on a colleague or uh, maybe lost a little bit with, you know, the manager said, I can't cope with this or sent off a ranty email in the evening because they're just feeling so so swamps and they're, they're then made to feel that the failure is theirs rather than the system that they're working in. I mean, Taj, is this something that you've noticed in colleagues or seen at all? I think the clinical environment that we're working in at the moment is certainly the toughest of my 35 years as a doctor. And so <clears throat> I've seen a lot of change in that time and maybe I've developed a bit of a thicker skin around that. But I, I, I look at a lot of my colleagues around me, some some of whom uh, find that really, really hard. And, and there are times that I find that really hard, especially when you're trying to deliver decent patient care and you've got you know, a hundred patients in the department that's made for sixty, and and you've got elderly patients who are you know on a corridor for fourteen or fifteen hours, and there isn't anywhere to for them to you know have a pee. Never mind, get them a cup of tea. And and so when you see you and your team struggling to de deliver just decent basic care, that's really hard, and you can see people struggling with with that, and or whether it's having a a cry or just feeling down and and it's really our jobs as seniors to to look out for them and look out for each other uh, and so the two things i say to you know our teams is your first priority is to take care of yourself and each other uh, because if you can't do that you won't take care of patients and your second priority is to look after the really sick people and and then after that the third priority uh, is really just to communicate and explain to everybody else they're going to have to wait a long time. Now that may, you know, not resonate very well with some managers or some politicians, but that's the world we're in, and there is no magic cavalry coming over the hill because the hole that we've dug ourselves has occurred over the past decade through underfunding by our government, and uh, we, we just need to be honest about that. We will get out of it, but it'll take a long time. And so we have to take care of each other. Sally, have you, you know, you've been doing a lot of work in general practice. You think similar? Yeah, I do agree with everything Taj said. The only thing I would say about the underfunding is it's I think it's only underfunding if we think that year on year forever we can continue to deliver and deliver and deliver. So if we're not going to 
set a reality on what a national service can provide, then yes, it will always be underfunded. So I think I strongly agree with Taj. I think we've got to be really robust at prioritising. And Rachel, you and I spoke recently and both Taj and, and Claire have contributed one of the two pieces to my toxic trio, which I've just recently, during the lockdown period, I've sort of identified. I think there are three things which are really not good in medicine and which make us more likely to fail. And they are, for me, are lack of prioritisation. And Taj just spoke to that beautifully. I think perfectionism, and Claire mentioned that, trying to look for perfection. And the, one, the other one I would add, which perhaps is more of a GP thing, is people pleasing. And I think that those three things together, lack of prioritisation, uh, perfectionism and people pleasing, are just likely to condemn us to fail. And I don't think any doctor should be doing that. And I think we just have to recognise we simply cannot do, do those things. But then going back to the things we talked about earlier, if we communicate and we're honest and we're open, we can just explain the situation we're in. And so sometimes I think the people pleasing is the one that needs to go first. I don't think perfectionism is healthy, but I think certainly trying to achieve high standards is, is always important. Just as, as Taj said, and I think of all of them, the most important thing to cling on to is prioritising. I think a lot of the failures that I've had in my career are not when I've done things that were wrong, it's when I haven't done things that were right. So I haven't had the right conversation with somebody. I haven't put my foot down and said, that's not okay. And that is probably because of people pleasing, because I'm scared of the consequences of doing that. So I can think of one of my biggest failures with, with a, a team that I was leading just letting some bad behaviour carry on because I was too scared of the consequences of addressing it. And I think in the NHS, we are really nice people. We like to be friends, don't we? And, and when I've gone into, you know, surgery so, um, and GP practices do team coaching, the biggest issue is not necessarily that they're all at each other's throats, although some of them are, <laughs> but often it's, you go and they go, we're all such a nice team. We love each other here. We're too nice. And no one is talking about the elephant in the room or the big thing that's happening. And so there's this people pleasing, wanting everyone to love each other all the time and not addressing the big issues. And that is much more of a failure than some of the stuff that we, you know, you might try and address the issue. You might do a bit clunkily. You might upset someone for a bit. And that feels like a huge failure at the time. But you can go and apologise and, and whatever. But actually letting it go on and on and on. I mean, I don't know, has that been your guys experience when you're running a practice in general practice obviously you're employing your own staff and uh, and this is absolutely what you're saying Rachel speaks to a couple of incidents we had in the practice really around things like staff absence and there've been a couple of occasions where I have just absolutely had to address things I'm so glad I did and I'm sure it made me unpopular there's a time when a lo one of our nurses who lived very close to me at home did, we had snow and she didn't turn up for work and ordinarily, it wouldn't have been noticed because the, the day she didn't turn up was my day, not in the practice. But on this particular occasion, I was doing an appraisal in my practice and I happened to be there in my wellies and my jacket, my snow jacket. And she wasn't there. And everybody, I said, well, where was she? And everybody said, oh, she couldn't get in because of the snow. And it was just really awkward for her that her near neighbour who lives 500 yards away had managed to get in despite the snow. And I, I'm afraid I, I insisted that that lady took a day's unpaid leave because I felt that was absolutely not acceptable. And I think, you know, there are times where you just have to, you do have to do things. I'm sure I was very disliked for that. But what it did was it, it set a message and a tone in the practice that we all had to pull together as a team. Everybody else had made it in. You couldn't just have these sorts of, you know, exceptions. Because you can't, if you allow that sort of thing to go, then before you know it, everybody's got a, a vague reason for taking time off. So I think people pleasing is is got to be avoided at times. I, I think we should all we should all try and be very nice people at work, but we don't go to work to win a popularity contest. Yeah, and you, you genuinely can't please all of the people all of the time. In a second charge, I'm just going to come to you and say, do you think the biggest failures are failures of omission or, or commission? Just a, a comment from Maya Lakani in the chat, in, in his view, bigger then people pleasing is defensive practice and transferring risk to other providers. Too much in investigation and, 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 and too much too much medicine. So this whole defensive thing, you know, defensive practice, trying to avoid avoid this 
short term hurt, which in the long term leads leads to, to longer harm. I mean, Taj, is this the sort of thing that you've seen? Yes, I think risk transference is a, is a major issue that is clogging up NHS. Of that, there 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 is no doubt, and I think that that's part of the the quality bar of the expectations and the resulting potential for litigation and or you know investigation or criminal investigation. You know, in in my twenty years here in Yorkshire, you know, there have been at least three of my colleagues who mistakes they have made clinic on the shop floor have led to a criminal investigation, which took at least 18 months to two years to resolve. Uh, and they were all three cases that, you know, when I looked at them, I thought, wow, you know, they're but for the grace of God, go I. And and so th- th- those are huge challenges and they're really distressing for the teams involved. Coming back to your other point uh, about a mission or commission. And, and I think one of the things that I've always, always been very strong on, and I, I've reflected on times when I failed to do this, is zero tolerance towards people being rude to my staff or, or, or to me. I can tolerate it to myself because I, I usually give them two chances and then I take them into a, into a room and have a pleasant conversation. But, uh, you know, it, it it's really interesting when you ring a specialty colleague up, and I'm not going to name specialty colleagues now, but uh, and say, you know, you've just had an interaction with one of my junior doctors, and I want to tell you that, you know, on reflection, I think you've been incredibly rude, and I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that matter. And it really does stop them. And, and of course, they will have their own narrative. And, and I, I, I will say, well, you know, I'm believing the person in front of me, so I need to understand how you're going to help me resolve this. You know, so the the the, the onus is on you to come come down and apologize, or come down and have a discussion. But how are you going to resolve this? Otherwise, we're going to end up escalating it, and it's going to go from a conversation where something bad happened and I wasn't there to something which then will require investigation. And, and and people know me for that now. And, and and I'd like to think that the culture of our department is better for not just me, but my colleagues as well who, who do this, you know, in different ways. You have to get people to be civil. We work in too tough an environment for specialties to be rude to each other and, and to, you know, the old adage of, oh, I'm a wall, not a sieve, as an admitting specialty doctor and I don't take any of those patients from the emergency department. So I think that that narrative has changed because we have more senior people on the shop floor uh, and and create created a, a, a better culture. Mm-hmm. And just sort of going back to you know the, the, this culture and there's been a lot of comments in the chat I've been keeping an eye on about the culture of blame when something goes wrong and blame failing the blame game. What can leaders do? This is a question that's come up in the chat. What can leaders do to facilitate learning from failure rather than blame? Because I know that uh, the whole point that we wanted to talk about here was that actually learning failure is a way of learning and it's probably the best way of learning that we have, un- unfortunately. And as, as leaders, we need to obviously role model that. But what, what else can we do to facilitate that? And there's another question that I think goes with this. So lots of people feel completely disheartened after failure and just like beat themselves up, feel absolutely awful. So what can we do as leaders? A, not to blame people, but then to help them not just feel so utterly crushed and disheartened. I mean, Claire, what what about you from a, a sort of trainee's perspective? What do you wish your leaders and your, you know, your consultants could do with you? If I've reflected on anything over the last four days, it's just the the beauty of having time and unfortunately it's something that it is hard to make space but I think the more we talk about those sort of little failures or quite big failures that you might be reflecting on a lot and you share that with your team the less likely massive failures are going to happen I think that would be the, the best way and to get that sort of culture shift if it's possible to admit to mistakes and learn from them but I you know I've been keeping an eye on on what the chat's been saying and yeah in a world where litigation is high and like Taja saying criminal investigation is possible 
that does conflict with that ability to open up to your um, mistakes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. When you think, you know, we're, we're all told, you know, you've got to speak up or so whatever, and then something goes wrong and all the blame is put on one particular person. And we've seen a very, you know, prominent case of that, which is which is almost put us, I don't know, how many years back in terms of wanting to speak up about stuff. It's been really, really difficult. I mean, Sally, what's your take on that? How can leaders facilitate learning from failure rather than blame? I, th I think you've got to let people talk about it. So you've got to find time. I appreciate, as Claire says, there isn't much time. This is where coaching conversations are really helpful and just having a very a very brief coaching agenda in your mind with somebody. So, But I think when people have failed, they've got to be allowed to out it because otherwise they'll carry it as baggage forever. And you've just got to give them, even if it's only two or three minutes of real deep listening and enable them to out it. And you don't necessarily have to, there's the, the no, no requirement for platitudes necessarily, especially if there have been mistakes, but there has to be, I think, a non-judgmental listening so that people feel heard. Therefore, even though they might acknowledge and accept that they have made a mistake, they recognize they're not alone and that they can now park that because it's been heard and outed they can now move on and take the benefit of, of the, um, the learning with it. So I think the important thing is to front up to people and, and let, them, let them talk about it. Yeah, so I think a lot of people can feel quite a lot of shame, can't they, when they fail? Because I know that you know, there's a big difference between guilt and shame. You know, if you've, you've genuinely made a mistake, you feel guilty because you, you wish that that hadn't happened, you regret your actions. And that can be quite a healthy emotion because that actually just shows that you're, you're human, right? Shame is, I'm a bad person because I did that. I'm an awful person. And if you carry that around, that's, that, that's really hard to deal with. And I think that we did a podcast recently about the second victim syndrome where, you know, someone shared, you know, when often, you know, mistakes as healthcare professionals cause harm and then the second victim being the, the healthcare professional that made that mistake. That's something that people find very hard to talk about and admit to other people the more you bottle up the more you tell yourself those toxic stories and and actually the person who's talking the podcast said that the really helpful thing would have been if someone came to them and said you know what that has happened to me that has happened to me in the past I've done exactly the same or or similar I've mm. made mistakes just like that and she said that is the one thing that would have made her feel better and felt like it's yeah. not leaving a dreadful person it's just one of those things that happen I mean, Taj, what do you think? How do you help people facilitate learning as opposed to just blaming themselves? This is so tough because we're all busy and we don't invest time in channels of communication around how we share our mistakes. And so, you know, in hospitals, it's great to, you know, if you think something go, gone wrong, you can do something punitive and put in a datix against specialty X and that makes you feel better because you think you're improving the system when in fact you're really getting back at specialty X and, and and so finding ways to regularly gather you know things that have gone wrong you know and finding uh, good facilitators to be able to share those experiences is, is a really you know, is really important we you know on the other end of the spectrum the extreme spectrum in the in the emergency department in the research room we try to do some hot debriefs when things you know when a patient has died especially young life or a child and it's very distressing and people some of the people there will think they've made a tragic mistake whether it was delay in assessment delay in therapy and you can't unbundle that at the time but you can give them a sense that actually there was so much that we did right. And so I think that's in the cute end of the spectrum. But at the other end, it's really important whether you're a clinical director or a medical director or, you know, a chief exec, that you find ways to give people time to share error and, and how the organisation is trying to handle it. Because I think the people on the shop floor often in the midst of everything just don't see, don't see enough of that. Good organizations have executive leaders that, you know, that, that are tangibly there and, and sharing and communicating in corridors. Uh, and, uh, and that's powerful because people then feel valued. 
And once you feel valued, you get through the day or you just want to deliver the best possible care based on it. And Taj, how do you think we make this just a, a part, part of training, a part of learning, a part of working? Because, you know, in the startup world, when you create a product, what you do is you create a product which you can fail fast at. I need to fail fast so we know, so we know how not to do that. And it's all about how can I fail fast? How can I fail fast? And you're looking for opportunities to fail in order to improve. Now, obviously, as doctors, we don't want to be looking for opportunities to fail when it causes patient harm. But how can we transfer that sort of mindset into our practices as, as leaders? I think getting people to focus much more around validated quality improvement strategies, because actually, you know, PDSA cycles are ways to fail fast and you keep going until you get better. And I think organizations, again, that have invested in training their people on validated quality improvement, th th those are really good ways. In the old days, once upon a time, we did these terrible things called audits. Uh, and I hated audit and I hated my bosses for making me do audit. And when I became a consultant, I promised myself I would never, ever uh, m make any of my juniors do audits, but I would help them do good quality improvement. Uh, and, and, and I think that's really important. That's a really good way to fail fast and feel that you're incrementally shifting the needle, which, of course, you know, is, is what we're trying to do. Thank you. Clara, Sally, have you got any, any suggestions? I think all of us could do with learning just to say to a colleague, uh, there's two things, isn't it? Are you okay? Are you really okay about what happened, what you did? Are you really okay? Do you want a coffee and talk about this? And I think all of that, and you know, that's a gift. That's a gift you give to a colleague. And maybe one day somebody will give you that gift back. And Claire, you just put in the chat that you've day to yourself. Several times. I think so, there was some uh, discussion about your comment at charge about day ticking specialty X because they've annoyed you. But I've definitely day ticked myself when I inadvertently discharged a patient that had been that had had a flu swab and uh, the consultant and me didn't check that result before discharging the patient. And they sat in the discharge lounge and exposed quite a lot of people to flu. And likewise with antibiotic prescribing error where you know, that Swiss cheese, the patient had come in with a sibling rather than their parent and they'd not disclosed an allergy. Fortunately, it didn't turn out to be actually an allergy. But yeah, Datix myself. And I think the importance of the, the Datix system is, is reading that feedback email that does sometimes take six, eight weeks to come back, but it shows that it's been reviewed and hopefully some reflections have been made by all parties. So Datix is your... Just for those people who don't know, it's the reporting system in hospitals, isn't it, with, it, with adverse incidents. Someone told me recently that the word AFOG, which stands for another flipping opportunity for growth. Yeah. <laughs> so wrong. I'm like, there's another flipping opportunity for growth. I'm like, OK, I feel dreadful about this, but what growth can I get out of this? What growth can I get out of that? And that has really helped me. But, you know, you have to say AFOG in quite a hacked off manner. Oh, it's another AFOG. Then you can get over it and think, right, okay, this isn't failure unless I fail to learn from it. It's only true failure if I fail to change what I'm doing or I fail to learn. And we've got a couple of minutes left. And there's a question in the chat about what do we do about when we're failing through the system time and time again, and it's repeating and repeated. We can put datixes in. What do we do when we just see that happening again and again and again? Maybe just a final thought from each one of us before we finish. I was just going to add to your AFOG and say, my, my father used to say that these are all CBEs. A CBE is a character building exercise. And so I, I've always regarded, I've had my character built humongously over the years. So I think working in systems that are failing, that, 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 um, you know, let's be honest, that's our NHS at the moment. You know, I think even system leaders, even NHS EI executives are saying our NHS is on its knees is really struggling. And what you have to do is just accept the fact that things may well go wrong, but the heart of it is what I said earlier, so I'm sorry if I'm gonna repeat myself, is caring for yourself and your team. We cannot afford to have good people go down because 
the next person next to them didn't realize they weren't very well because of a bad incident. Uh, so you have to care for the team and the executive's responsibility is to channel their communication really well to show people on the shop floor that they are valued. And that's really important. And that will then allow us to take care of the people who are really ill. And that's our core job, the ill people who uh, desperately need our, our support. And everybody else, for the time being, is going to have to wait. Thanks, Todd. I would say just be very consciously aware that you have the four T's at your disposal. This is from sort of risk management. Take it, treat it, transfer it or terminate it. And I think that you can be consciously in control of any of those four decisions. I've certainly left jobs because I felt I couldn't fix the system. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sally. So difficult choices to be made. Finally, Claire, you get the last word. Someone has uh, taught me sort of self team others. And I guess that's uh, seconding what Taj has said. And you can't look after everyone else if you're not looking after yourself. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you so much, um, Taj, Sally and Claire, for being with us. I hope that that has helped convince maybe some people that, that FAIL is not a, a nasty four-letter word. It is actually a four-letter acronym, which stands for First Attempt in Learning. That failure is just the flip side of success. You can't actually have success unless you have failed and, and learned from that. We just need to get some strategies around dealing with it and, and, and not be scared to, to, to do the hard stuff as leaders because that's why we're leaders, it's to do the hard things. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks everyone who's been listening. Thanks so much to the FMLM for, for having us at Leaders in Healthcare. So check out the rest of the podcast uh, episodes we have on You're Not Frog. We've done a whole four podcast series on failure. So you might want to check that out as well. So thanks everyone. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please share it with your friends and colleagues. Please subscribe to my You Are Not A Frog email list and subscribe to the podcast. And if you have enjoyed it, then please leave me a rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. So keep well, everyone. You're doing a great job. You got this.